Thank you. Anytime. Good. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. I know it's a uh, time in the term when people are really busy and struggling to keep up. Um, so I have a handout, and I'm hoping that that has managed to make its way around. Is that true? Everybody's OK? Hey, can you guys hear me OK in the back? No? <laughs> can you hear me OK now? Uh, so if at any point I'm failing to project and you can't uh, make out what I'm saying, please just flag me, and I'll try to speak more loudly, OK? Um, I tried to make enough handouts, but in case I didn't succeed in that, if you could kindly look on and share with a neighbor, that would be terrific. Um, OK, so the plan, just to give you a heads up about this, is basically to talk for about 35, 40 minutes and uh, try to make progress on one aspect of the complicated issue of ethics and the global environment. Um, after talking through uh, both sides of this handout, I, I think we can stop, and if those uh, of you who need to, to go or relocate, feel free to. And um, those who want to stay on for question, uh, further discussion, I'd be more than happy to stick around. I think we, we have the room for an hour and a half or something like that. So I'm happy to stay as long as you would like to keep talking. Um, OK. Let me begin with a few assumptions. I'm not going to argue for these, but I just want to lay them out at the outset. We live in a time of significant global environmental change which takes the form of mass extinctions, ozone depletion, climate change, and so forth. Global environmental change is causing or will likely cause significant harm to humans, other animals, and non-human nature. Among humans, the global poor and future generations appear to be most vulnerable. Other things being equal, I assume it's wrong to cause significant suffering or harm. Okay, when are things not equal? Well, uh, sometimes you might need to cause significant harm in order to defend yourself from, say, a lethal threat. So that might be a, 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 an excusing condition, a self-defense uh, exception. Uh, presumably, you also want to say that um, if a condition of meeting your basic needs is that you sometimes have to cause serious harm, then that seems to be permissible. Um, whether you want to say something much stronger than that, such as, um, you could be excused from causing harm in order to meet what seem to be non-basic needs, or needs in quotes, uh, luxuries. OK, this is very debatable and something we can talk further about. I'm not going to say much about that here, um, but I'm just going to suggest that other things being equal, uh, it's wrong to cause significant suffering or harm. Here are a couple of conditions where um, that might not um, uh, be uh, uh, impermissible to cause harm. OK, final point. Some of the worst effects of global environmental change can probably be mitigated or adapted to. Okay. Now, on that assumption, the question is, how should we distribute responsibility for addressing global environmental change? Now, over the next few minutes, what I want to try to do is sketch three possible principles that have been articulated in the philosophical literature, trying to instruct us, help us think more clearly about who should have what responsibilities with regard to addressing global environmental change, where that might take the form of mitigation, adaptation, restoration, or some other uh, practical um, action. OK, first principle. Let's call this a historical principle. Uh, this principle is historical uh, in the following way. To judge whether a given distribution of goods is just or unjust, we must know how that distribution came about. Okay. Now, the usual view here, if you're an historical theorist, is that if there have been just acquisitions of the goods or a just chain of transfers of the relevant goods, then whatever results from those acquisitions and transfers are themselves just, okay. even if there are great inequalities in the holding of different goods. Now, there's an important qualification on this basic view that was given by John Locke, uh, who's one of the philosophical uh, ancestors of this kind of view, a libertarian uh, outlook. Now, Locke said that you must leave enough and as good of critical natural resources, otherwise you would be violating the principle of justice and acquisitions. OK, so what does that mean? Simple example. You have no right to take private property in the only water hole in the desert and then charge everyone else who needs water exorbitantly high prices. OK, so that would be ruled out according to this view um, as, as violating the principle of leaving enough and as good. OK, in the cases where there have been violations of 
the principle of justice in acquisition or violation and transfers. Um, you need, according to the historical theorists, a principle of rectifying past injustices. Okay. So how does this play out in the environmental context? So a common principle, a common version of an historical principle in contemporary policy and philosophical discussions is the following, something like the so-called polluter pays principle. The idea being here that, uh, quite simply, if you break something, you have a special obligation to fix it. Okay. Now, um, one way of thinking about this is uh, to look at a particular case, such as uh, historic contributions to filling up the atmosphere, which we'll assume is, is a sink that has an, uh, a certain amount of absorptive capacity with regard to greenhouse uh, gases. And the thought is, um, our sink is probably too full, and therefore we're causing or about to cause significant climate change due to the atmospheric sink being overfilled. Now, if that's true, the historical theorist says um, what we ought to do about this is going to have something to do with um, who has historically caused the sink to be clogged or overfilled or whatever metaphor you prefer here. Okay, so just to give you an idea of uh, how things might look um, on one, one assessment of the data. So according to Stephen Gardner, uh, he says that responsibility for global emissions from 1850 to 2003 would look like the following if you just took some representative positions. The United States is responsible over that time period for 29% of the total emissions. The EU countries, European Union nations, are responsible for 26%. In contrast, China is responsible for 8% and India 2%. Okay. Now, on the assumption that the capacity of the atmosphere to absorb our wastes or our emissions is uh, a scarce good, okay, um, you wouldn't want to violate the enough and is good principle by um, taking more than your fair share of that absorptive capacity. Well, it looks like that has incurred, and here might be some data to suggest um, how the responsibilities would line up with regard to who should take the lead on addressing uh, problems related to climate change, which is one important aspect of global environmental change. Okay, so implication of this circle principle is, look, you might have differential responsibilities in the present to shoulder more of the burden of addressing global environmental change, such as climate change, if you are historically responsible for having uh, contributed to the problem to begin with. OK. Let me just mention uh, a few objections that have been raised to this kind of a principle. Okay, I don't mean, mean these to be exhaustive, and everything I say here will be sort of tentative and provisional, and we'll probably want to come back to this in discussion if you'd like to pursue it further. But here's, here's one thought. Um, some people look at this and say, industrialization, which has caused the filling up of the atmospheric sink, just to, to stick with that case for the moment, um, actually has generated all kinds of benefits. And these benefits ha are compensating benefits, so that um, it's the case that even if some countries, say the current day rich countries, the industrialized countries, the so-called developed countries, have in fact historically contributed more than their fair share to the atmospheric sink filling up, the claim is, yeah, but uh, a bonus that came with that behavior was now we have all kinds of things like science, technology, medicines, and so on and so forth. Okay, one quick response to this is just to say, um, it seems that the benefits uh, at best have been pretty mixed and very unevenly distributed. Okay, so this doesn't look like the kind of um, objection that would get much traction with someone who's actually attracted to the historical view. Okay, let me consider a second, um, perhaps more serious objection for this kind of view. I'm just calling this the ignorance objection. The basic problem is this. <laughs> During the time, or much of the time, that the countries were contributing to the filling up of the atmospheric sink, they didn't know that doing so was actually going to have as a consequence the sink getting filled up, which would then precipitate climate change and other untoward environmental effects, which would have, of course, social costs, uh, not to mention the, the bad effects for animals and non-human nature itself. Um, and so, according to this kind of view, look, if you're ignorant of the fact that your action is causing this bad effect, uh, that's an excusing condition, right? 
Now, one thing to look at initially here is to say, well, that's not obviously the case. We often think that um, even if you were ignorant that what you were doing was going to cause some problem, you're still responsible for that problem. Um, and so we usually separate responsibility from, let's say, blame. So maybe you're less blameable in virtue of having been ignorant, but you're still responsible. That's a common view. Okay? And this seems to be exactly the view held by those who argue for something like the polluter pays principle. But suppose you press this and you say, OK, look, it does matter. It does seem relevant that for much of the time that these countries, the countries that are currently the rich countries, um, were emitting massive amounts of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse uh, gases into the atmosphere. They really didn't know about this, and that seems to matter in some sense. Well, matters till when? Well, maybe up to, say, 1990. right? Maybe 1990, you could no longer plead ignorance post-1990 because you have the first uh, inter intergovernmental panel on climate change report that comes out and says, clearly, global warming is a serious concern, as it was called back at that point. And um, that seems to be the sort of thing that even if you were enamored of the ignorance objection being serious, you could still say the countries in the present have an obligation to uh, basically take responsibility for their emissions post-1990. A quick comment on this is an empirical question of what the emissions would then look like. But Peter Singer has summarized the data as follows. He says, actually, if you just looked at 1990 up through the present, um, the emissions wouldn't reduce as much as you might think. So the United States emissions, for example, might be cut in half. That's substantial. Okay? But you're still talking about something like 16% of the total just from 1990 up to the present. So that's, that looks non-trivial. Um, ditto for the EU nations. It looks like their emissions would drop to about half. Okay, so they'd be in the ballpark of 13% according to Singer. Um, on the other hand, China's emissions raise considerably. They now approximate the US emissions, and they would be something like 13% of the total. So if you only started at a 1990 baseline, this would matter. OK, is the point. And that's very relevant to contemporary policy debates if you're gripped at all by this ignorance objection. OK, more to say about that, but let me leave it there for now. Um, let me mention a third objection. This objection goes something like this. Those who committed the wrong in this case, those who, for example, emitted all these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, they're dead. They're not around. <laughs> and according to the polluter pays principle, the idea is the polluter pays. Right? If the polluters are gone, or the emitters are gone, or whoever causes the problem are gone, um, you might think this sort of weakens considerably the force of the idea that the countries in the present, uh, who historically emitted uh, more than their fair share, according to the historical argument, um, ought to do something by way of taking the lead for addressing this. OK. Um, one thing to say to this is, look, those who live today are the beneficiaries of enduring economic structures, which were the cause, historically, of the overfilling of the atmospheric sink. OK, so you have to concede that it's not exactly polluter pays, but something like beneficiaries pay principle, fair enough. But the claim is that you can still make sense of that being morally uh, obligatory on the part of those who have benefited from the historic emissions. Um, because they have participated in economic, socioeconomic structures that have endured over time. OK. Let me get a little power water here. OK. Uh, I'll skip for now the practicality objection. We can come back to that later. Uh, I, I see uh, Garrett is, is wincing at, at this um, worry. You can come back to it. I'll allow you to take the lead in the Q&A. OK, let me turn to a second principle. Um, you might say, look, there are pretty vexed problems facing the historical principle. Maybe they're serious enough that you're tentative about relying solely on it in order to figure out who should shoulder responsibility for addressing global environmental change, such as that associated with climate change. OK, so suppose that's the view. You might instead invoke, invoke something like an ability to pay principle. I'm just borrowing this notion from Henry Hsu, who's written a lot on this. Um, the ability to pay principle is pretty straightforward. As the name suggests, with regard to a common problem that needs some kind of common solution, people need to contribute something to the solution. Those who are 
more able to pay ought to shoulder more of the burden. Okay, so basic idea. It's actually a little bit difficult to argue for that in, in some more basic terms because that just seems to be it. If you are better off and it would, uh, you're more, therefore more able to pay uh, with regard to solving some problem, you just ought to because it, it, it's the case that you're better off. So let me say a little bit more to motivate this idea, if not exactly justifying it more basically than the principle itself already does. Nothing about appeal to the ability to pay principle presupposes that existing inequalities or holdings of goods is unjust. Okay. So it just doesn't take a position on that. So they're not unjust, say, for historical reasons. Furthermore, you might think that if the difficulties faced by the historical principle are significant enough, you might want to find some alternative principle, and one might be the ability to pay principle that just sidesteps difficulties associated with the historical principle. Okay, so that's appealing to a lot of thinkers who look at this. A um, couple of other thoughts, turning to the second side of the handout. The ability to pay principle avoids what seems to be a really bad problem faced by something like an alternative principle that says we should have a flat contribution rate. Okay, so all parties to um, whatever um, endeavor we're trying to solve should just pay a single flat rate. Well, the obvious problem there is that this is um, a very significant burden on those who are least advantaged. Okay, so those who are least well off, least able to pay, are going to have a much higher burden in virtue of that fact. And the ability to pay principle corrects for that. Okay. A final thought on this is that the ability to pay principle is entirely forward looking. I mean, it basically says, look, I don't care about the past. We've got a problem. We've got common problems, plural. We need some kind of solution. Here's a way to move forward. Okay. So a lot of people seem attracted to the second principle precisely for uh, the ease with which one might get on board with it. Okay. Um, it seems to me there's one serious objection to this principle. I just want to draw attention. There might be other objections that we can entertain in the Q&A, but here's one. Um, critics worry that if you were serious about institutionalizing an ability to pay principle, you could have serious disincentive effects on, um, on people. So the following being the case, um, just to make it very simple, right? Um, why should I work really hard, develop my talents, get a college degree, try to get a high paying job, if it's going to be the case that I'm just going to have to shoulder more of the burden of solving some problem that I may not have even created? Okay. That's the sort of logic that's behind the, the disincentive objection, the thought being that you're going to disincentivize people developing themselves individually or collectively in exactly those ways if it's the case that ability to pay is the principle that is going to be appealed to when you're trying to solve some problem. Okay, um, it seems to me, one quick reply to this and then we can move on, it seems to me that the question of incentives or disincentives relating to this principle is not something that you can answer in the abstract. I mean, it seems to me that try out different versions of the ability to pay principles, see what happens, and then adjust things accordingly. So this kind of objection doesn't seem decisive um, as an objection to the principle, but it might be relevant to the way it gets instituted and where the rate gets set. Okay, so uh, much more to say about that, but I think I can leave it there for now. Let me turn to a third principle, also argued for by Henry Shu which uh, we'll just call for simplicity the guaranteed minimum principle. Here's the basic idea. When certain characteristics are true of a situation, this principle kicks in. Here are the characteristics. Total aggregate or aggregate resources are sufficient for all to have enough. Some have more than enough, and some much more than enough, and some have less than enough. You could call a situation that has these features one that's radically unequal. This is a term from Tom Nagel. Uh, radical inequality is, is a description of exactly this situation. Total aggregate resource enough, some have more than enough, some much more than enough, some have less than enough. Okay, um, one simple example. This raises all kinds of other complexities, but I'll mention it nonetheless because it'll give some um, content to this idea. Just take the case of nutritional deficiencies. Because there are a lot of people starving in the world or not doing well with regard to meeting their basic nutritional needs. At least a billion or so, okay? A non-trivial number of human beings are desperately poor, which includes, among other things, not having enough to eat, okay? And then another billion are not doing too well, but they're slightly better off. So a significant portion of existing humanity is not doing well. Um, 
it's commonly remarked that we don't have a supply problem when it comes to, say, food. We have ample food. Of course, we waste it in all kinds of ways by feeding it to animals and eating the animals or biofuels and this sort of thing. But there's not a supply problem, right? There's a distribution problem. This is a common, common observation. OK, so just one simple example. People don't have enough to eat. Answer, uh, there are total aggregate resources in this case, uh, grain to meet nu nutritional um, needs. And so it seems true of our situation, at least regarding uh, food. OK, an obvious question if you take seriously the guaranteed minimum principle is, what's the relevant minimum? How do you want to specify that? You could argue about this. Here's Shu's answer, Henry Shu's answer. Um, the minimum is just having your most basic vital interests satisfied. Okay. So it's very minimalist. Something like you would subsist. You wouldn't starve, right? It's not a luxurious life. It's certainly not living a life characteristic of, say, middle class American. But it's uh, a life where you're much better off than at least a billion or so of existing humanity is currently um, experiencing, much better off than they are. OK. Um, the main beneficiaries, I think it's pretty obvious, of this principle would be those who are currently most vulnerable, so the global poor, okay, children among the global poor in particular. A couple of objections to this principle. Um, again, and not meant to be an exhaustive list, but a couple of considerations that might worry you. Um, some philosophers think that it's just not the case that members of one political community have any obligation to help members of another political community get up to some minimum standard of living, particularly if they're not in any way causally implicated in the, the members of the other community being in a bad way. OK. Uh, so call this the political membership um, objection. Uh, one thought is, look, well, this is kind of a quaint view. <laughs> Seems false of our own world with uh, considerable socioeconomic interaction, global trade, and so on. So you might just put pressure on it from an empirical standpoint. So it's just false. Therefore, uh, this is, is not a, a plausible view. Um, but even if you thought there was something to this, that other things being equal, you have greater obligations to those with whom you share some sort of political affiliations, not, not like Democrats to Democrats, Republicans to Re Republicans, but fellow citizens. Okay. Um, even if you thought that, you might nonetheless think that you have just basic obligations of humanity to people who are desperately down and out in relevant respects. OK. Here's a different kind of objection that worries people who take seriously a guaranteed minimum. Let's just broadly speaking refer to it as a population problem. OK. Um, here's one version of it. The worry is that if you help people who are desperately poor now, you're just going to push down the road a situation where more people are desperately poor, and you may not be able to help them. And so it's even a worse problem that you've created. Um, I take it that something about that might be right in, in particular cases, and that might be worrisome. And there's a whole question and kind of complex discussion to have about what would be uh, a just way of proceeding. Here's one view just to sort of give you a taste of the possible position. We can return to this later if you like. Uh, Peter Singer says, look, this is a really serious problem. And one of the things that it means we should do is tether assistance to those who are below the relevant minimum to uh, certain um, conditions uh, about these countries, for example, the governments of these countries having reasonable population policies. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, the worry is that you're trying to avoid cases where, let's say, a population policy for nationalistic reasons or religious reasons um, is not reasonable. Um, it's, it's not at all mindful of the sustainability of the population in question. Singer says, look, maybe you don't give aid in those cases. Right? That looks harsh. Why? Because it's going to hurt the, the poorest uh, among the recipient countries. And often, it's just the case that they didn't have any say in the policy of their government anyway. They're already socially marginalized. This is uh, not, not a pleasant implication. But nonetheless, you can see the logic of at least this kind of response to it. OK. Let me leave discussion of objections here and make a few summary remarks of, of the discussion so far. Clearly, there's a similar rationale for both the second and the third principle, the ability to pay principle and the 
guaranteed minimum. Namely, you want to avoid making the worst off worse off. Okay. Also, there's a, a, a symmetry between the first and third principle because they share the view that existing inequalities are wrong. First view says they're wrong because of how they came about and were never redressed. The third view says they're wrong because they're radical and can be fixed. Okay. Two, as I said, the ability to pay principle seems pretty agnostic about whether current inequalities are unjust. Its focus is on trying to specify reasonable burdens based on uh, holdings, current holdings and capacities people have for addressing a common problem. Okay. The conclusion that's interesting, I think, of considering these two, three quite different principles that have different philosophical groundings is that they all converge on the same conclusion, namely that the rich countries, the developed countries, the industrialized countries, they ought to take the lead in addressing any of the problems associated with global environmental change, such as that associated with climate change. OK. Let me switch gears for a moment and conclude with a brief uh, discussion of the question of individual versus collective responsibility in all of this. So I've been assuming in most of what I've said so far that uh, the relevant agents who have obligations to other uh, entities are usually nations, so collections, collectivities. And one question you might have in this is, uh, what should I do? Like, what should an individual positioned in a country like ours do about any of this? Now, this is actually a pretty difficult question to answer in some ways. Here's why. There's a basic problem that individual actions are not decisive with respect to the outcomes that actually produce the problems that you're trying to redress. So there's a collective action problem here. Now you could hold different views uh, about what to do regarding this fact, that individual acts don't actually cause the problem, and therefore you might think that you don't have a, a reason to do something about it. Here's one view. Walter Sinney Armstrong, contemporary philosopher, American philosopher, um, says, look, my individual acts, his provocative example is taking you know, joy rides in my gas-guzzling SUV, um, make no meaningful difference with regard to, for example, producing climate change or producing other untoward effects for nature. And therefore, it's hard to see how that act could possibly be wrong. The individual act, hard to see how that could possibly be wrong. Hard to bring it under a moral principle that would tell you why it's wrong. Um, OK, a couple of thoughts on this. Even if one is true, even if Senate Armstrong is right about that, um, there's still a role for individual responsibility, even on his account. Namely, he thinks you have an obligation to lobby the government to come up with <laughs> procedures, laws, and uh, policies that would make it impossible for you to take a gas guzzling joyride. OK, so obviously he thinks you need a collective solution, but um, he doesn't think that this shows anything interesting about you doing something wrong with regard to this particular act. Um, let me mention a, a sort of provocative contribution to this debate made by uh, a philosopher, James Nolt, um, recently. He says, it's not obvious that uh, the right level of analysis here is individual acts. You ought to be thinking about acts over a lifetime. Right? And the claim would be something like this. I won't go into the sort of complicated math story that, that Nolt tells, but his account is basically that over a, a lifetime, an average American who lives something like 75 years would contribute uh, enough to um, emissions, uh, in CO2 emissions or CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere. And given the plausible empirical assumptions about how long that lasts, and that this will be at least a millennium that you're talking about negative effects on future people. And over that course of time, you're going to have billions of people who come to exist. He works out a rough claim that goes something like, you, uh, by living the way the average American lives over a 75-year period, uh, could be responsible for the serious suffering, possible death of at least two future humans. If that's true, big if, but if that's true, I take it that's a non-trivial implication of your lifestyle considered over the course of a lifetime. OK, so that's a possible uh, way of putting pressure on Senate Armstrong's view. Here's another thought, very basic idea. Individual agents can affect collective behavior in all kinds of ways, okay, through example setting, through role modeling. And you might think, even if Senate Armstrong's right, you should still try to be a good role model in relevant respects. Um, 
Let me close with one final thought here, the, a possible position one might articulate with regard to this question of individual responsibility. You might think that embodying certain so-called green virtues um, will allow you to flourish more fully as a human being. Okay? Lots of philosophers make this argument today. It's something that's actually become uh, uh, an area of considerable philosophical activity. Um, what's the idea? right? So if you, for example, were to um, come to embody um, certain virtues such as humility uh, or virtues such as mindfulness about the sources and sinks of your production and consumption or things like um, took seriously the distinctive goods of non-human others with whom you share the world. Um, all of these things um, would actually lead you to leave a be lead a better life um, when you embody those virtues than if you didn't. And as a bonus, right, these would have good consequences. Okay, but that's not the primary argument being made here. Um, okay, a lot more to say about that, but let me leave it there. Thank you so much for your attention. So I'm happy to stick around if you would like.